This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Can you go down to the pad here? What we were doing, it seems, uh, this, is, this is the topic we were doing uh, before our, our quarter was interrupted by the schedule. We were talking about the idea of the gain of a, of a matrix in a direction. So this is actually very, very important. It's act, this is sort of at the, at, at the heart uh, of the overloading y equals ax. Um, if you have y equals ax where a, y, and x are scalars, it's, you don't, I mean, it's very easy. That's, mul that's simply multiplication. When you have a matrix here, it's much more interesting uh, because, in fact, the amount by which the size of y divided by the size of x, that's the gain of the matrix A in the direction x, this varies with direction. That's exactly what makes it interesting. Now, there are cases when it doesn't vary with direction. You've seen one. One is when A is orthogonal. So if A is square and its columns are orthonormal, then y equals ax, the norm of y is the norm of x. The gain is 1 in all directions. So we're actually going to get the complete picture uh, today on that. So last time we asked the question, what is the maximum gain of a matrix? And we answered it. And the answer was, well, it's, uh, first of all, it's got a name. We gave it a name. The name is the norm of a matrix. And it is given by the square root of the, of the largest, whoops, <clears throat> there we go. Here it is. The square root of the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A. Now, you have to be very, very careful here because A is not necessarily uh, symmetric. In fact, it's not even necessarily square. A transpose A, of course, is always square, however, and positive semi-definite. So that's the norm of a matrix. And that tells you exactly what the maximum amplification factor of a matrix is when you consider it a mapping uh, y equals ax. But we know more. We know things like this. The maximum gain input direction is the eigenvector associated of A transpose A associated with lambda max. So that, that's the, that would be the input which is amplified by the largest factor. The input that is amplified by the smallest factor, input direction, is Qn. That's the eigenvector of A transpose A associated with lambda min. Okay? And of course, this can be 0, which is just a long-winded way of saying A has a null space. Because if you're in the null space, it means you, you come in non-zero, you come out 0, it means the gain is 0. So this, this is a, a, a um, quantitative idea that generalizes uh, the qualitative idea of null space. OK. Well, this brings us to the whole story. And the whole story is the singular value decomposition, otherwise known as the SVD. Now, it's been a while. Historically, it's been, it, it's been around for quite a while, uh, maybe 100 years. So, uh, actually, certainly 100 years. It was certainly well known in the 20s and 30s. Uh, it's been used in statistics. You'll hear other names for it. Um, the one you'll hear most is PCA, which is Principal Component Analysis. And you prob there's probably a couple other words for it in other strange fields. That came out the wrong way. That, that was not to imply that statistics is a strange field, although it is a bit odd, actually. So, uh, but anyway, so you'll hear other names for it. Uh, certainly in some areas of physics, it's got some name. and. Um, I guess in other contexts, it's called things like the Carhoun and Loeb expansion. That's something else uh, you'll hear about, the, the, the KL. You'll hear all sorts of names. But the main ones are singular value decomposition, principal component analysis. OK. And the singular value decomposition is a, a triple matrix decomposition. By the way, we've seen a bunch of them by now. Uh, not that many, actually. But we've seen a bunch. And it is very important to keep your matrix decompositions uh, clear in your mind. Um, we've seen diagonalization. That's something like A equals T, lambda, T inverse. We've seen uh, QR uh, factorization. We have seen an orthogonal eigen decomposition. That's something like A equals Q, lambda, Q transpose. And then this is, a, this is yet another. By the way, there's lots of others as well. Maybe not lots, but five or so, or so other common ones. OK, so here it is. It says that any matrix can be written out this way. It's A is U sigma V transpose, where uh, A is M by N with rank R. This intermediate matrix sigma is diagonal, and its size is R by R. So it's exactly equal to the, to the rank, its size. And the, the singular values, that's the sigma 1 through sigma R, these are ordered always uh, from largest to smallest. So sigma 1 is the largest, and sigma R is the smallest here. 
And these are positive. U and V are both matrices with orthonormal columns. So U transpose U is I, and V transpose V is, is I. So that's what, that's what these are. So it looks like, it looks like this, um, U, and then sigma, which is diagonal, um, and then V transpose can look any size like that, for example, could look like, for example. Okay, that would be a, a, a typical way this might look. Okay, so this intermediate dimension is the, is the rank of, of the matrix. Now you can write this lots of other ways. If, if you write the columns of U out as U1 through UR and, and the columns of V as V1 through VR, then you can write this U sigma V transpose out as what people call, as, as a dyadic expansion. So that's a dyadic expansion, which of course means you're writing the matrix as a linear combination of dyads, and the dyads are UI, VI transpose. Dyad is just a word for a rank one matrix, also called an outer product so in, in other fields. Actually, there are no other fields. This is math, so. So sigma i here, these are called the singular, these are the non-zero singular values of a. So there's actually a bit of a confusion, and we'll get to that in, in a bit, and I'll, I'll warn you about that. So it's as to whether or not singular values can be uh, zero. Um, in, the, in the definition I've just given you, the singular values are all positive, period. So it doesn't make any sense to say sigma 5 is zero. But we'll see that, in fact, there's a lot of confusion on the streets about this, and people do refer to uh, singular, zero singular values, but we'll get to that. Okay, now these VIs are called the right or input singular vectors of A. We're going to see why in a minute. And the UI are the left or output singular vectors of A. And it sort of makes sense. If A is U sigma V transpose, you can see that when you sort of operate, but when you form AX, the first thing you do is you multiply by V transpose X. But you know what that is. That's expanding V in the basis, in the VI basis. That's the first thing you do. Then you scale, and then you, you uh, send the output uh, along the UI basis. So, that's, these are the, so these are really orthonormal bases sort of for the, for the input that actually comes through the system and the output. So we'll get, we'll get more into that in a minute, but it, it's clear V is associated with input and U with output. That's clear. Okay. Well, these things are, right at the moment, they're quite mysterious, but I think we can clear up the mystery very quickly. If you form A transpose A, and A is U sigma V transpose, transpose times U sigma V transpose, if you transpose this, you get, you get V, sigma is diagonal, and therefore symmetric, so sigma transpose is sigma. Then you get U transpose U sigma V transpose, that goes away, and you get V sigma squared V transpose over here. And what that says is the following. It says that V sigma squared V transpose is, the, is an eigenvector decomposition of A transpose A. So A transpose A is a symmetric positive semidefinite matrix. If you write out its eigenvector decom or spectral decomposition, you get V sigma squared V transpose. That's this thing. And so those are the input singular uh, directions. And that says that, the, that, that these are eigenvectors of A transpose A. It also tells you exactly what, the, now we know what the singular values are. They are no longer mysteries. The singular values are the square roots, sigma i is the square root of the ith eigenvalue of A transpose A. Okay? And that's for i equals 1 to r. Those are the only eigenvalues of A transpose A that are positive. Uh, then they become 0. And in particular, sigma 1 is nothing but the norm of A. It's the square root of the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A. So sigma 1 is the maximum gain. Um, that sort of makes sense. We'll see why that, that's the case uh, in a minute. And we can actually see it right now, but I'll, 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 I'll wait a minute. Now, if you multiply A by A transpose the other direction, you get A A transpose. Then you just multiply this out. This time the V goes away, and you get U sigma squared U transpose. And what you find are that the, eigen, that the UI are eigenvectors of A A transpose. So that's what they are. These are the output directions. And the sigma i are, again, uh, the square roots of the, of the eigenvalues of AA transpose. And here a question comes up. Um, you, now you have two formulas for the sigma i, which is the right one. Well, they're both correct, because it turns out that the eigenvalues of, let's see, CD are the same as the eigen, the non-zero eigenvalues of CD are the same as the eigenvalues of DC, whenever these are both square matrices. 
Was there a homework problem on that or something? I have a vague memory of this. Yes, okay, there was, good. So, in fact, AA transpose and A transpose A, which, by the way, generally have different sizes. But the non-zero eigenvalues are the same. By the way, this is super useful. I can give an example. If I ask you what are the eigenvectors or eigenvalues of PP transpose or something like that, that's a symmetric, or the actual, I don't even need that. I can just do it the other way around. Let's make a general thing. PQ transpose, there you go. So PQ transpose is a rank one matrix, and I ask, what are the eigenvalues of PQ transpose? You would use this, th you'd use this, this theorem to answer it, where you'd say, well, they're the same as the, eigen the non-zero eigenvalues correspond to the eigenvalues of that. That's a one by one matrix. I know what the eigenvalues of a one by one matrix are. It's just the number. So that says that the eigenvalues of PQ transpose are Q transpose P and, and N minus one zeros, if that's N by N. Okay, so this, I'm just giving you an example, but anyway, this, that was just a little aside. Okay. Now, we can actually say what these U's are. Now, obviously, if you write A is U sigma V transpose, if you plug anything into A, like AX, you get a vec and some vector here, and, you get, and it gets multiplied by U. So anything of the form AX is a linear combination of the columns of U. Therefore, the columns of U actually certainly are a subset of the, are a subspace of the range of A, but in fact, they're exactly equal to the range of A. Because I can make I can make this thing be any vector I like, including like e1 through e r, here. Okay. So u1 through u r are an orthonormal basis for the range of A. Now, v1 through v r are an orthonormal basis for the null space of A, uh, the orthogonal complement, not the null space of A. In fact, it's sort of the opposite of the null space of A. These are the input directions that basically are not in the null space. That's one way to say it. So if you're orthogonal to V1 through VR, you're in the null space of A. That's what, this, that, that's what this means. So this connects once again to all sorts of things you've seen bef before. So let's, let's give some interpretations now of what this means. A equals U sigma V transpose. Well, it means this. You can write it out as a dyadic expansion, or you can think of it as a block diagram. As a block diagram, it works like this. It says take a vector in. And the first thing you do is you, you expand, you partially expand it. Of course, the v's are not a basis because there's only r of them. But it says you, you partially expand v. You calculate the vi coefficients for i equals 1 to r. That's v transpose x. So that's an r vector. This is r vector with uh, the coefficients of x in a vi expansion. Then you scale those by positive numbers. You scale these by positive numbers. That's all you do. Uh, that's diagonal, no interaction. Then you take those positive numbers and you reconstitute the output by multiplying by this matrix whose columns are orthogonal. Now, by the way, when you move from here to here, that's an isometric mapping. In other words, distances going from here, this is distance in, this is distance in RR. That was big R, big bold R with a superscript little r. And then this is in R, uh, I can't remember now, M, is that right? Yes, this is in RM. So the, this mapping is isometric. Distances are preserved exactly, angles preserved, everything here, norms, everything. Okay? So this is kind of the, uh, the idea. Um, now, this, this looks exactly the same as if, if A is square, it looks just like an eigenvalue decomposition for symmetric A. Actually, there's one difference. In a symmetric A, this is diagonal and real, but they can be negative because you can have negative eigenvalues. And in that case, U and V are the same. The input and output directions are the same. By the way, that sort of makes sense. That's what symmetric means. Symmetric means something like you can swap the input and output, and it looks the same. Because when you transpose a matrix, that's, that's what you're doing. You're switching the roles of the input and output. So this kind of makes sense. But this, so this is, this is the picture. By the way, you can see all sorts of things now about uh, you get a complete picture of the gain as a function of direction now. And let's see how that works. If you want to find an input here for which the output is as large as possible, that's here. That would be the maximum gain input direction. You would do this. You'd say, well, look, distance here is this norm here is the same as the norm here. So if you want to maximize the norm here, 
You don't even have to worry about the U. Just make this as big as it can be. So it says what you really want is you want this vector, then scaled by these numbers, sigma 1 through sigma n, to be as big as possible. Now, when you put in a vector here of unit norm, here, it, you're going to get uh, V transpose x is a set of numbers whose norm is less than 1. I guess that's Bessel's theorem or whatever. And I believe you had a homework problem on that, too. So because it's the partial expansion in the VI coordinates. How would you make this come out so that what's going to happen to this vector is this vector is going to come out. It's going to be a, a bunch of numbers whose squares are going to add up to less than 1, less than or equal to 1. And then they're going to be scaled by positive numbers. You, if you want that to come out as big as possible, you have to put all, all of this into the first component because it, it, it is going to get the greatest amplification factor. And that means you want V transpose X to be E1. And there's only one way to do that. And that's to choose X equals V1. That's the first column of V. So, I mean, but you can check this. You can verify this many other ways. I'm just explaining how this works. Okay? So that's the idea. U1 is the highest gain output direction. And of course, you have AV1 is sigma 1 U1. In fact, of course, you have AVI equals sigma I times UI. So it basically says that, you, that, that the ith, ith singular value is amplified, singular input direction is amplified by the gain factor sigma I. So the sigma I's are, are gain factors. So let's see, actually, if we can figure out um, how this works. Um, Hmm. Am I missing something here? Page 30? No, I'm not. There we go. All right, here we go. So let's take just a 4 by 4 matrix. That's not that complicated. Obviously, that's, that's so small that you can figure out what happens yourself. Actually, that's on the boundary, to tell you the truth. Even with a 4 by 4 matrix, you can't look at it. No, one, no person can look at a 4 by 4 matrix, except in totally obvious cases like when it's diagonal, and say something intelligent about how the gain varies. I mean, you can say a few things. You can mumble a few things and wave your arms, but you really can't say much more. Um, so you can imagine what happens when you have a 500 by 500 matrix. But anyway, let's take A is, is an R4 by 4. And the singular values are 10, 7, 0.1, and 0 0.05. So the first thing we can, we can ask all sorts of questions about what, what does that mean about, it, about the matrix and its gain properties. Well, the first is this. The rank of A is 4 because you have four singular values. So A is U, sigma, V transpose. U, V, are, and sigma are all 4 by 4 in this case. And what this says is that the gain varies from as small as 0 0.05 to as big as 10. So that is a 200 to 1 ratio of, of gain. So if you want to know how isotropic is this mapping in the sense of how much can the gain vary with direction, the answer is 200 to 1. We'll talk actually later this lecture about what that isotropy means, and isotropy means, um, lack of uh, isotropy. So the gain varies from 0 0.05, so it has no null space. However, there is an input direction which is scrunched by a factor of 20 to, 20 to 1. And there's another input direction which is amplified by a factor of 20 to 1. Okay? So, and we can be much more specific about it. We can actually say that inputs Input, if you, have an, if you have an input, if x mostly is in the plane given by, spanned by v1 and v2, these are orthogonal, that's the two large, most sensitive input directions. If you're in that plane, then you get amplified by somewhere between 7 and 10. That's what it means. Okay? So there's, there's one plane of input directions for which this system roughly has a gain on the order of 10, or you know, between 7 and 10. By the way, the outputs come out along the directions spanned by U1 and U2. Those are the two most sensitive output directions, or the highest gain output directions. Now, at the other side, there is another plane, by the way, orthogonal to the original plane. That requires, by the way, some serious visualization skills, advanced visualization skills, since it's an R4. But you have another plane, orthogonal to the original the high gain plane. Now you have a low gain plane. Inputs that are along these, in, these, in this low gain plane they get scrunched by a factor between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. Okay? And they're going to come out. Well, they'll hardly come out. But they'll, if, when they come out, I mean, they'll, they'll be greatly attenuated, but they'll come out along U3 and U4, spanned by that low gain output plane. That's the picture. Okay. Now, depending on the application, you might say that A is rank 2. 
that's, that's going to depend entirely on the application. Obviously, it's not rank two. Mathematically, it's rank four, right there. Um, however, in some cases, you might, you might say that A is rank two. If, if someone says, oh, the gain, if this is some, some kind of communication channel in a wireless system, that's a gain of plus 20 dB. That's like minus 26 or something like that. You might say, you know what? That's below the noise floor. That's worth nothing. So. OK. Let's look at a, another sort of baby example here. Let's take a 2 by 2 matrix. Now, for a 2 by 2 matrix, you do not need singular value decomposition to understand what it does. That, that's for sure. That much is for sure. OK. With a singular value of, of, of 1 and 0.5, basically what it says is, is you take something like x here. There'd be an input coordinate system, that's v1 and v2, and you would resolve x into its components. That would be this and this. This v1 gets multiplied by sigma1 and then comes out along u1. So whatever that is, if that's, if that's v1, let's, let's say that's about 0.55. Then that, you get 0.55 times u1. Where's u1? That's over here. Uh, this should be bigger, huh? Shouldn't it? A little bit. I didn't draw it right, I think. Well, anyway, it's about right. Um, that should come out about here. And then for u2, you get maybe, I don't know, 0.7 v2. 0.7 v2 should get scrunched by 0.5, and you should get 0.35 v2. And indeed, that's at least visually uh, a third. So that's about right. And that's the, that's the output. That's the picture. OK. That's the singular value decomposition. It, it, has, um, it, it's, uh, it has spread, in fact, to almost all fields. Uh, any, any field that uses any math, uh, any field that does any computation. So you will hear about it in different contexts. You'll hear about it in statistics. You'll hear about it in finance. You'll hear about it in uh, basically anything. Signal processing, control, uh, wireless stuff, networking goes on and on and on. So you'll hear all about it. Um, so it's actually a very good thing to know. It's probably it's the... It, it's, the last, it's the last real topic for this class, um, and it's, it's very important, and you'll be, it's, you'll be seeing it if you, unless you, uh, unless this is, well, anyway, you'll, you'll be seeing it in many, many contexts. Um, so it's, it, there's actually still some weird backward fields where it hasn't hit yet. It's coming to those fields. So um, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch where I think actually, let's see, the last, I, the last couple of years, it's sort of hitting fluid mechanics. So that, that's, that's the one I know about most recently, um, which is amazing because it's this incredibly complicated, very, very sophisticated field, and they just didn't know about this, and it's a big deal now because it explains all sorts of stuff there. But anyway, it's also used in tons and tons of other things. It's used in, oh, let's see, it's used in the, the, the current standard for DSL is basically straight out of the SVD. So all multi-input, multi-output wireless systems straight from SVD. So a lot of, a lot of uh, methods for compression and things like that, straight out of the SVD. Uh, another one, uh, this is, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's, a, it's only a small stretch, but it turns out, in fact, um, things like Google's page rank, uh, you may have heard this, straight from the S. It's, it is nothing, the zeroth order description of page rank, SVD. It's nothing else. So anyway, I just want to point out, uh, this is actually an incredibly important topic. Um, so I. I I want to say that because others obviously are much less important. For example, our friend, the Jordan Canonical Form. So, but we, we teach that just so you know about those things and, and can defend yourself if needed, if you're, you're caught in a dark alley late at night with a bunch of mathematicians. So, OK. <laughs> Who are pissed off. OK. So let's look, uh, we'll, just, we'll just do a couple of applications, but like I say, you go to Google and type this or some of its synonyms like PCA, and there'll be million, literally millions and millions of hits. There are whole fields based on this. So, okay. so you'll be seeing a lot of this. So the first thing is we can actually, I can now tell you the whole story on the pseudo inverse. This is for any A not equal to zero. I've already fixed the notes. I just haven't posted it. But I just noticed this mistake this morning. So um, for any A non-zero, has a singular value decomp. Oh, so people don't really say that the, the zero matrix doesn't have an SVD or something, or it gives you a headache or so, I don't know, something like that. It's it's because um, there's no really. I mean, v and u would be zero by. They'd have to be zero by something. And so any non-zero matrix has an SVD. So so if you have a non-zero matrix and its SVD is u sigma v transpose, then 
The Moore-Penrose inverse is V sigma inverse U transpose. That's it. And you can check this agrees exactly with the two formulas for the Moore-Penrose inverse or pseudo-inverse you've seen so far. So you've seen when A is skinny and full rank, there's this formula. And you've seen when A is fat and full rank, there's this formula. But this formula here works for any matrix that is non-zero, any at all. So, and it basically does what you think you do. If you wanted to sort of invert this, you'd sort of make a V transpose over there. Sigma is square, invertible, diagonal can be, of course, inverted. And then you do something like inverting U. It would be inverting U if U were square. You'd make it U transpose, and you get this. So you switch the role of the input and output directions, invert the gains along those directions, and that's what you get. OK. So that's the general Moore-Penrose Moore inverse. It coincides exactly with these uh, in these two cases, but it's now generalized to other situations. And in fact, in the general case, here's the meaning of it. So let's look at the general case when A is not full rank. So A is not full rank. If A is not full rank, things get, when, and you want to do least squares, least norm, things get tricky. So let's see how that works. If A is not full rank, the first thing you do is you say, well, how close can, can you get to Y with something of the form AW? This would be least, this, would, this is a least squares problem, except now A is not full rank. Okay, so up till now, you actually did not, did not know how to solve this. You would form your, a, your trusted A transpose A inverse, and right at that point, you'd have a problem because A transpose A is not invertible if A is not full rank. Okay? So, however, if you want to minimize this here, this, it's, you still, there's still a, there are still, you can form this least squares problem and ask, how close can you get? Now, because A is not full rank, the answer is not going to be a single point. It's going to be actually a whole set of points, an affine set. So, it's going to be the set of points for which AZ minus Y, the deviation, is as small as it can be. That's an affine set. It's the set of least squares solutions. Now, in that set, you can then ask for the small, the minimum norm least squares approximate solution. And that's exactly what a dagger Y gives you. So this is, this is quite complicated, but it's worth thinking, it's, it's worth thinking about. And you should be able to, to sort of see what it, what, it, what it does now. So this is, this is the picture. So, so x pseudo inverse is the minimum norm least squares. And I really should put approximate here because I don't like writing. I don't even like, uh, I'm going to fix that. I, I don't even like saying least squares solution because the whole point is it's not a least, it's not a solution. I know that that's what everyone says, but it irritates me. So I'm going to change it. It's an approximate solution. OK. Now we can also do the pseudo inverse uh, via regularization. So let's see how that works. Um, so let's see how, how that's going to work. Um, so let's let mu be positive. And then this is, the re this is the regularized, this is ticking off regularization or ridge regression, you would call it in statistics or something like that. And here you add up, you, you have two things. You have sort of your, your mismatch. And then you have something that penalizes the, the size of x. Um, by the way, it's clear this is related to, you're going to be related to pseudo-inverse because pseudo-inverse finds, finds among the x's that minimizes this, it finds the one of smallest norm. So it's, it's clearly, relate, these are clearly very close. Now this, here there's a perfectly good formula. It's simply a transpose a plus mu i inverse a transpose y. Um, this inverse is valid, period. A can be fat, skinny, full rank. For that matter, A could be zero here. It's fine, no problem. Because okay? the, the, the mu i takes care of everything. And this is always positive definite. OK. Now, as mu goes to zero, this limit gives you this pseudo inverse. And in fact, it turns out, if you want to get the pseudo inverse, this is another formula for it. It's, a, it's the limit of A transpose A plus mu i inverse times A transpose. So it's, it's the limit. Another way to understand what the pseudo inverse is, if you don't like the SVD, you can think of it this way. It's the limit of regularized least squares in the limit as mu goes to zero. Now, in some cases, this is super simple. If A is skinny and full rank, then 
this, this makes sense when mu equals zero, and it just converges to our old friend, this thing. But this formula is quite different in other cases. If A is fat and full rank, A transpose A is definitely not invertible. Okay? But A transpose A plus mu i, as long as mu is positive, is invertible. And this inverse makes sense, and this will actually converge to this A dag. In fact, in that case, it would converge, of course, to A transpose A, A transpose quantity inverse, which is your other formula for it. But the other cool thing is that even if A is not full rank, this converges to that, the pseudo inverse. So that's what it is. So the pseudo inverse is something like the limit of infinitely small regularization or something like that. As usual, the important part is to know what it means, uh, not, not to know simply that it exists and so on. OK. So that's, uh, now you know the full story on the, on the pseudo inverse. Now, like a lot of other factorizations, like the QR, and I think we've seen a couple others, maybe just QR, you can extend uh, a, a factorization by zero padding matrices on the left and right. You do that to make, to make certain, by zero padding some and then padding out other things in convenient ways. One way is to, like, for example, fill out an orthonormal basis. So you can do that with SVD, too. So if you take the, the that's the original SVD, like this. So R is the rank. These are all positive numbers. What you do is you find a matrix U2, which is complementary to U1, and you find a complementary matrix to V1. So this is, that's V2. Complementary means that the columns of V2 are, when you, together with the columns of V1, form an orthonormal basis. And you know lots of ways to do that. One, one way is to run QR by appending, for example, the identity matrix uh, after uh, U1 through UR. That would do. So what you're going to get now is U1, U2 is actually now a square matrix, and it's the output size. It's m by m. And you'll get a matrix V1, V2. By the way, these look, when, when written like this, like they're fat. They're actually square, because U is tall here. Right? So this is actually a square matrix, although visually, when printed, it doesn't look like it. That's square as well. That's the input direction, and they're both orthogonal. So now what you do is to make up for the fact that you've just added a bunch of extra columns on U and V, no problem. You zero pad sigma, and you get something like this. You have this. Now, sigma is no longer square. It's diagonal in the weird sense that off the diagonal, entries are zero. But generally, people don't talk about diagonal matrices that are not square. I mean, I, I don't know why they don't, but they generally don't. And then these are just zero padded with scores. By the way, some of these could be zero, depending on A. Uh, so for example, if A is skinny and full rank, like this, it means it's rank R. And that says that when you write out it as U, sigma, and V transpose, um, this, one of these is going to already be, is going to be square. I guess this one. That's your V transpose. So in this case, if A is skinny and full rank, the, you don't have to actually add anything to V. For example, if A were fat and full rank, you wouldn't have to add anything to U. OK. I hope I got those right. I might not have, but too bad I didn't. OK, so you zero pad like this, and now you, now you can write once again, um, A is U sigma V transpose. So you have A is, is this thing, and it works out this way. And people call this the USV, uh, the, sorry, the full, this is the full SVD of the matrix. In, in this form, what happens is these are actually orthogonal matrices, U and V, but sigma now has exactly the same size as the original matrix A. It's diagonal, I mean, in the sense that, that that's the only place where it can have, but it can also have zero entries. And the, the one we looked at before, if you want to distinguish it from this, is called the compact or the economy SVD. And I think I, I, I'll, I should mention this. It's actually quite important in MATLAB, for example. If you just do this, I think you get the full thing, although I don't remember. Is that correct? OK. And if you want. If you want the compact one, I think you write something like this. Some, it, that's econ, the string econ, I, I think. But, no, anyone have a laptop open? Hmm. I know Jacob was, uh, is not here, so anyway, OK. Um, so by the way, this is quite important. Uh, let me mention a couple of reasons this is important. Um, you don't want this, if A is, for example, I don't know, 100 
by uh, 10,000. Then there's really, uh, just, in, just forget the computation. Let's talk storage here. So you can be in big trouble if you, if you type this. Um, if you type this, it's going to return a V, which is 10,000 by 10,000. And if that's not big enough of a dense matrix to make trouble, you know, make this 100,000. And now, for sure, you're in trouble. So unless you want the big one, um, you could actually be in big trouble. Here, this one would do the right thing. It would return something that was, if this was full rank, it would return a 100 by 100 matrix, no problem. A 100 by 100 diagonal matrix, definitely no problem. And a, and a uh, 10, uh, in this case, 100,000 by 100 matrix, again, that would be no problem, okay? But it won't work, other, it, 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 if you try it, this one, it won't work, okay? So I just, I just mentioned this, so, but it is important. Okay, um, now here, by the way, is where the confusion on zero singular values comes in. So it turns out there, and let me, let me explain it in, in, in this context. Um, let's just take a matrix A that's in R like seven by seven. And let's say it's rank six, okay? So the SVD or the compact SVD or economy SVD looks like this. It's U, that's six wide, and you get a six by six diagonal, and then you get a V transpose, um, which is, this is gonna be six by seven, okay? V is seven by six, okay? So this is the this is, uh, this is what happens in that case. And the singular values are sigma one through sigma six. However, when a matrix is square, a lot of people will talk about sigma seven in this case, and they'll say it's zero. And there are actually applications where uh, you want to talk about that. Because in fact, what you might be interested in is, what's the minimum gain of this matrix? Well, it's rank six, it's got a null space. The minimum gain is zero. And then people will talk about V seven. V7 is, of course, nothing but an element. Uh, it, it, it actually, in this case, it describes the null space of A. Yeah. So, so, the, so it turns out while sigma 1, V1, U1, these things are sort of unambiguous. But if someone writes something like sigma min, you have to be kind of careful. Do you mean the minimum of the positive ones, or do you mean the actual minimum, in which case it would be zero for something like this? So in things like this, you just have to ask because it just depends on the context as to what, whether a person is referring to the smallest positive one or the smallest one period when it's zero. Of course, if things are full rank or whatever, there's no issue here. The, the, there's no ambiguity. So, okay. So let's look at the, uh, the ge a geometric interpretation of how this works. So here's a full, a full, this is full SVD. That's to make it simple to, to do the interpretation. You have A equals U sigma V transpose. We know exactly what orthogonal matrices do geometrically. They either rotate or they reflect, or something more complicated but equivalent. They preserve angles, they preserve distances, they preserve norms, right? So it's an isometry. All, anything related to distances, angles, or whatever is preserved by V and U. They're like rotations. Okay, so this says, to operate by A on a vector, you carry out three operations. First, you multiply by V transpose, then sigma, then U. So the first one is something like, a, a, and I mean rotate loosely in the sense of, uh, of course, a rotation is an orthogonal matrix. A rotation is given by an orthogonal matrix, but it could also be a reflection or some combination of the two. Okay, so the first thing you do is you rotate. Then you stretch along the axes by sigma I. Now you, you put in the, ga the differing gains. So far, there's been no no difference in gains anywhere. Because if you multiply by an orthogonal matrix, it's actually, it's completely isotropic in the sense that the gain is one, all directions. Now you put in the gain uh, and isotropy, right? So you put in the gain, the unevenness in the gains now. By the way, some people call this, I've heard dilate, and I don't even know how to pronounce this, but it might be dilatate. Does anyone actually know how to pronounce that? First, for a long time I thought it wasn't a word. But then I found in enough books that I realized it was a word, and then I thought it was like a weird variation. Maybe something like from the UK or something like that, you know, just some weird thing. But it turns out, no, it, it, it appears to be a word. Um, I don't know if they're exact synonyms or not, but anyway. But you'll, you'll hear this, this operation 
when you stretch or scrunch something along the axes is, is a dilation, that makes sense to me. Dilatation, actually, I've heard people say it. Even people who seem to know what they're talking about say it, so I suppose it is a word. Okay. Um, you'll also zero pad or truncate because when you, this middle action here uh, actually is going to map something of different size, you know, different, it maps, it, its input and output are different sizes. So you zero pad or truncate depending on whether the output is bigger than the input or smaller. So that's what you do. And then the final thing is you rotate by U. So this means that we can calculate what happens if you have an, a, a unit ball. We can calculate exactly what happens. Take a unit ball. First, multiply a unit ball by V transpose. If you take a unit ball and you apply an orthogonal matrix to it, nothing happens. I mean, the individual vectors move. This point might move over here, but the ball is invariant. The ball is the same. So anything that's in the unit ball, if the image of it is the same unit ball. Not at the detailed level, not on a vector by vector basis, but on the set basis, it's the same. Okay. Now you take this ball and you, you apply a, a, a dilation to it. And in this case, it's a dilation along the axes because you multiply one uh, here. There's a singular value of 2 and a singular value of 0.5. You take the 2, that's along the x1 axis or whatever, and you, you stretch it by 2 and you scrunch it by a factor of 2 in x2. Okay? Now you take this thing and you, and you rotate by this output these output directions, and you get this. And you can see all sorts of cool stuff here. You can see, for example, that indeed U1 is the largest gain output direction. Because the unit ball are all the things, all the things that went in here were things of norm 1. The biggest that any of them ever came out is that guy, and that guy, by the way. So those are the two points that came out with the largest possible gain. And look at that. Sure enough, they're aligned with U1. And what input direction, by the way, ended up here? What input direction was it? V1, precisely. So V1 is some vector here. Say that's, that might be V1. V1 got rotated to here, or here, by the way. Wouldn't matter. It got rotated either to here or to here. And those are the two points on this ball that suffer, or on the, the sphere, that suffer the largest expansion here, and ended up here. Then it got rotated over here or here. So that's it. So it says that the image, this says that the image of the unit ball, image means you take, you overload matrix vector multiply to apply to sets. So you multiply a vector, a, a matrix, by a set of vectors. You just multiply all the vectors and you get a new set. That's what this is. And it says that the image of the unit ball is an ellipsoid and the principal axes are exactly sigma i u i. Okay? Now, this is just what this, this allows you to understand exactly the gain properties. And let's do an example for fun. Let's do a couple of examples, in fact. Let's start with this. Suppose the singular values are 5, 4, and 0 0.01. There's, there's your singular values. What does the image of the unit ball look like? What does it look like? It's a pancake, exactly. Slightly oblong pancake, but it's a pancake for sure. Everybody, everybody agree with that? And this says something like this. There is an input plane. Let's say it's a mapping from R3 to R3. It says there's an input plane, which there's a plane where this thing has kind of high gain, like between 4 and 5, and another gain. You might even call V3, you might even call that a, like an almost null space. because while AV3 is not zero, that would qual qualify it for full null space membership. It is not zero. But it comes out attenuated by a factor of 100. Okay? So it's something like an almost null space. And in fact, this is exactly the kind of ideas you want to have um, when, when you do this. In fact, you'll find that all of these ideas about null space, range, all that stuff, it's wonderful. You have to understand all of it. However, in practice, these things are quite useless and quite silly. Very silly and, quite, and very useless. You, what, you, what the SVD will do is it, will give you, it gives you quantitative ways of talking intelligently in the, in the context of some application 
about things like null spaces and ranges and things like that. So here, the range of this matrix is R3. It's on to, at period, up until maybe, up, for the, up to the third week of the class, it's on to, period. Now, in this context, depending on, you know, the details of the application, you could say that matrix actually has a range which is two-dimensional. It's, it's a lie. It has a three-dimensional range. But this, it's, it's got its third direction is so feeble, the gain is so feeble that depending, again, depending on the context, you might say for practical purposes, that matrix is rank two. Okay? So this is, this is what this is going to allow you to do. We're, we'll, we'll see a lot of examples of this, so this will become clearer. Okay, so that's a pancake. How, what's this? What's the image if the singular values were 5, 4, 3.9? What would the image look like? Just roughly. Egg, sure, and uh, yeah, not even, and maybe not even quite an egg. No, maybe an egg, I don't know, something like an egg, right? So basically it says that there's one cross-section, it looks kind of like an egg. Maybe not even as much as a football or something like that, but an egg. That's that, okay? How about this? It's what? Cigarette toothpick. Okay, tooth, I'll take toothpick. Maybe I misheard that. Did someone say cigarette? Okay, yeah. No, no, no. I'll, I'll take toothpick. Yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a toothpick. That, that's what that is. And it basically, actually what you could say is we'll see this quite precisely soon. You could actually say in this case that matrix is nearly rank one, uh, depending on the application. So I want, I want to stress that. So that's, that's the idea. Okay. So let's see how the SVD comes up in estimation and inversion. Y equals AX plus V, where Y is the measurement, uh, V is a measurement noise like this, and X is something you want to estimate. Now, probably the best way to really get deep, more deeply than we've gotten into this, although to tell you the truth, the stuff you know is gonna, it's gonna work quite well in practice and go quite far. So what you would do is you might do something like this. You might do least squares here. You might take Y, choose to estimate x, you would take something like a dagger y, okay? Which would be a transpose a inverse, a transpose y. And you would say that that's the x that minimizes the discrepancy between what you actually measured and what you would have measured had the parameter been x hat or something like that. Um, better models, well, maybe not better, I don't know. Different models are obtained uh, by looking at probability and statistics. So here you assume v has some distribution. But there's another model, and the other model says this that this noise, I don't know anything about this noise, but I'm willing to give you a bound on its norm. Okay? So that's some people call that a norm bound model or something like that. Um, and it's, it's, some people call it a worst case model or something. And it's a lot more forgiving than a statistical model. Um, this is, we're not looking at statistical models, so it doesn't matter, but a statistical model basically says V is random. So V is not out to get you in a statistical model. In this one, V can be out to get you. V can include someone intentionally trying to mess up your measurement. So V can actually be, include things like somebody in, intentionally trying to jam you. It can, it can include something related to X. For example, V could include quantization error in this case. So it would be another model for quantization error, something like that. But anyway, that's the model that, where you know nothing about the noise except you have a norm bound on it. Okay. Now let's put an estimator in, a linear estimator, and let's make it unbiased. That means BA equals I, and you know what that means. It means that if you form X hat as BY, if there were no noise, you get perfect reconstruction no matter what X is. So that, this means it's perfect reconstruction with no noise. Now the estimation error is this. If you form X hat, that's what you guess, minus what X really is, it's BV. Now this makes sense. We've seen this before. The key now is to do this. Among left inverses of A, what you want is a small one. Why does it want to be small? It wants to be small because B is what amplifies, amplifies the noise. So B does two things. It maps a measured vector into an estimate, but it also measures, it also maps, est, let's see, measurement noise or error into estimation error. 
So you want B small. B can't be that small because after all, B A is I. So for example, you can't take B as zero as an extreme case, obviously. Okay. Now we can then analyze, using this model, the set of uh, possible estimation errors, and that's an ellipsoid. Um, actually, there's a, there's a more refined ellipsoid you can get that's smaller, but we'll, we'll just do this one. So here you, get a more you can get a more refined ellipsoid, but for now we'll just do this. We'll just say that the, if, if you get BV and V ranges in some unit ball, then in fact the set, there's an ellipsoid, which is BV, as V ranges over all vectors of norm less than alpha. This defines an ellipsoid, and we're going to call that the uncertainty ellipsoid. Note that it has nothing to do with y. <coughs> Actually, that's the key to the, to the more refined estimate. But this is, this is fine for now to give you a rough idea. Then it says that this is where the estimation error lies. But an, ellips an ellipsoid center of the origin is symmetric. So you can say x is x hat <coughs> minus x tilde. That's x hat minus. It's in x hat minus this uncertainty ellipsoid. But minus and plus an ellipsoid are the same because an ellipsoid is, is invariant under uh, negation. And that says that the true x has to lie in an uncertainty ellipsoid E this, this E uncertainty. It's centered at the estimate x hat. And you can say exactly what the uncertainty ellipsoid is. B here, uh, the singular values of B give you the semi-axes of the uncertainty ellipsoid. So you want B if, for example, these were the semi-axes of B, then we can talk about what it means. In this case, if these were the, the, if these were the singular values of B, Therefore, these are the semi-axis lengths multiplied by alpha, when you multiply by alpha of the uncertainty ellipsoid. In this case, very different. This one says your ignorance is pretty much isotropic. It means that when you guess x, x hat, where x can be compared to where x hat is, is pretty much uniform. It's uniform. It, it's kind of in all, your ignorance in this direction is kind of, you know, it, it's not too much different from your ignorance in that direction. And if you want, you can imagine a GPS system or something like that where you're estimating position. And it basically says, I guess if someone forces me to guess where I am, I say I'm here. But if someone says, how far off are you? You'd say, well, I'm, I could be three mil, you know, plus minus three millimeters this way. But it's about equal in all, in all directions. Everybody see this? If, however, this is the story, you get something much more interesting. This says, well, I'm pretty, in fact, in, in an, this is an estimation context. These are the singular values of B, remember. This says, in, in that context, you would say, well, in two directions, I have, so I have, I have uncertainty on the order of plus, you know, plus minus four millimeters, let's say. In another direction, I have, I, I ha I've nailed it. I have way, way better, better. I have much, much better um, un uh, uh, estimate of the uncertainty. So in this case, the uncertainty ellipsoid is a pancake. Remember, for an uncertainty ellipsoid, small is good. This is better still. This says, in two orthogonal directions, I have a very, very high confidence in my estimate. But in one direction, it's really way, way worse. So that's what it says. Okay? So that's the, that's the picture. Okay. Um, so that's the, that's the idea. Okay. So, you can work out, for example, the worst error is the norm of, of B, for example. And it turns out, in fact, that the best thing, again, by this measure, is actually using the least squares estimator. So if you use least squares estimator here, in fact, uh, your, your uncertainty ellipsoid will be, given by this formula, will be as small as it can possibly be. So, so it, and if, you care, if, if what you care about is uncertainty ellipsoid, or if you, if you believe this analysis and so on, um, then once again, our friend least squares is the best estimate you can come up with. In other words, if someone says, no, I'm not going to use least squares, I'm going to use some other fancy thing, um, you'll get an uncertainty ellipsoid with some other left inverse of A. You'll get an uncertainty ellipsoid that's actually bigger. It's in, in all directions. That's what will happen. And that comes out this way. That's, that's B least squares, B least squares transpose less than BB transpose. And that's that. So, once again, we see that least squares is actually a good thing to do. So let's look at this um, example, our uh, navigation using range measurements. So here I have four measurements to estimate two positions. And we looked at two methods. One was the uh, just enough measurements method, where you take the first two measurements, you say, look, I got two unknowns, 
All I need is two measurements. I'll use the first two. You don't even need the last two range estimates. Don't even need it. So you, you form this left inverse, right, like this. It's got a two by two block and a block of zeros. And then we'll compare that to least squares, which is x hat is a dagger least squares. That's a two by four matrix. A dagger is this matrix that blends your four ranges into, uh, into your two S, your position of your x and your y position. Okay? And from the same example, here's what we get. Um, this is with alpha equals one. In the first case, you get this. And in the second case, you get this. Now, wh what is correct here is that if you were to translate this over so that they have the same center, they lie on top of each other, in fact. Or sorry, this one completely covers that one. Okay, so that's the, that, that's the picture. Now, there is something a little bit confusing about this, and I, I can, I'll, I'll say what it is, and it has to do with the fact that our analysis here can be sharpened a little bit once you have y. This idea that the, that the set of, uh, that this set, this is this uncertainty ellipsoid, the idea that this set uh, contains x minus x tilde, that's, that's completely correct. However, this does not depend on, on y. Uh, in other words, it's independent of the actual measurement you made. It turns out that if you make, once you have the measurement, you can actually get a smaller uncertainty ellipsoid. Um, and it, it's, it's not very hard to show. I won't do it now. Um, but that would explain why, for example, if, if one estimator says you have to be in the shaded set, another one says you have to be in this shaded set, then for sure you have to be in the intersection. And the intersection of those two is some weird thing that looks like this. It's this little guy here. Everybody see that? And then you'd say, wow, so although this was not a good method, it actually did give us information. Because it ruled out, for example, all these points over here that this model allowed you to keep. If it turns out if you do the, the, more, the, the more subtle analysis of uncertainty ellipsoid, you get something that's the same, si that's the same shape as this, but it's, it's, uh, it's smaller, like it's scaled down, something like that. So, OK. I, I just mentioned that because it's, well, I confused myself this morning when I looked at this. That, that, that's what it is. It, this doesn't matter. The, the main point is that you can understand uncertainty and how a measurement system works now by looking at the singular values of b. That, that's what you can do. Okay. I think what I'll do is I might actually, I'll skip, I'll skip this, uh, this thing, which is just a completion of squares argument um, that, that is a method to show that if you have any left inverse, it's going to end up with bb transpose is bigger than the b least squares, b least squares transpose. So I'm, I'm just going to skip that because it's just a, um, it's, it's a completion of squares argument. I want to get on to one other topic. So we're, now what we're going to do is, oh, I, I guess I can, I can uh, make some other comments about, um, let me make it just a couple, couple more uh, points about estimation and inversion. So in estimation and inversion, let's go back to that and look how that works. You have y equals ax, say, plus v, like that. Now in in some cases, in fact, I'll just tell you in a, a case where, I don't know, I, that, that I was involved in. And it was, it was geophysical inversion. So x had a dimension around 10,000, something like that. And y was a bunch of magnetic anomaly data. And it was, some, it was something like 300,000 or something. So, I mean, if these numbers aren't right there, the, the story is going to be, the story is going to make the right point. So 10,000 variables, 300,000 measurements. Like, no problem. In fact, that sounds like a, it was like a 30 to, it sounded like a 30 to 1 ratio of measurements to parameters you want to estimate. That's a pretty good ratio, right? 1.1 to 1 is not so great. 30 to 1, that's sounding pretty good. You've got about 30 times more measurements than you need. Everybody got cool on this? Okay, so they'd say, no problem. A is full rank, by the way. And so, you would imagine you would form this. Uh, you would form that, something like that. OK. And in fact, you could do this, and you would get things. Things, things would come out, and it would be shown in beautiful color uh, that would show you uh, the substructure, the presumed substructure, and things like that. So that would be it. OK, no problem. Now, this matrix A, I can tell you what its, its singular values were. 
Okay, its singular values were this. Now, actually, how many singular values does it have if it's 300k by 10k and it's full rank? So how many singular values does it have? It has 10k, 10,000. So I'll just, I'll just jump to the end of the story. It had about 20 significant singular values. After that, they dropped off precipitously and were, and were way small. They were like below the noise floor. Okay? Everybody see what I'm saying? So the sad thing, at that point, people had to accept the following. They paid a lot of money to fly an airplane with uh, this, this uh, squid the, you know, uh, magnetic anomaly detector around. They got 300,000 measurements, 30 times more measurements than they had unknowns. 30 times. Which you would think would be way, that's a lot of measurement redundancy, 30 to 1. And it was very, very sad because they thought they took 300,000 measurements and in fact, they didn't know it, but they actually took only 20. So they thought they were in a 30 to 1 measurement to data position, but in fact they were in something like a 1 to 500. So what it meant was this X hat, though very pretty, very nice when rendered in, in color, basically was completely meaningless. Now 20 compo you could estimate about 20 parameters in X if you wanted, but certainly not 10,000. So, so this is an example of uh, the kind of reasoning or understanding you would have if you, when you fully absorb the idea of SVD. And it's sort of this step beyond what happens uh, when you first just sit around and talk about rank and range and null space and things like this. This matrix has no null space. There was no arrangement of sub subsurface there's no x for which ax is zero. None. None. So in fact, without, without the noise, you can get x exactly. In fact, by many methods, because there's lots of left inverses of a. This is, what, this is your understanding of, as of week 2.5. Okay? Um, now, it's, it's much more subtle, and it basically says that for all practical purposes, you thought a was full rank, it was actually like rank 20. The question? Do you know why that happened in this particular situation? Was it some property of the airplane or type Y? I'd like to say yes, but the answer is no. I don't know why. I don't, you, you know, yeah. I could make up a story, though, about it. It would be pretty good, too. Um, yeah, I, I could make up a story. I could probably even get the number 20, I mean, with a long enough story, right? Um, but but no, I, no, I don't know why that is. It just, it, it just is. So, but it's a very good question. Actually, it's because of that that you'd want to then, if someone's, once you've come to the realization that although you have 300,000 pieces of data, you actually only have 20 measurements, independent measurements, the next question is, what, what are you going to augment it with? What are the other, do you want to do, do you want to drill a couple of exploratory wells? Do you want to do, you know, uh, magnetic anomaly, gravitational anomaly, you know, do you want to set up some explosives? These are all getting other different measurements. And actually it would be interesting there just to find out which, which, one, which one of those would, improve, would augment these to give you, and all you, all you do, completely trivial, is you, you add some more rows to A. Each me, any measurement is a row to A. You add more rows to A and find out what happens to your singular values. And if you go from 20 non-singular, non, you know, significant ones to 50, you just added 30 more measurements. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, the, the additional measurements beyond the number of parameters you're estimating, that goes into smoothing, blending, averaging, this kind of thing. I mean, that is the, the matrix we just looked at. I, I don't know if you remember it. I remember it. The two by four matrix. I mean, that kind of says it all. Uh, you should think of a left inverse in that case as actually um, a lot of, I mean, I, I love the names sensor fusion is one. It's a great name. Uh, sensor blending. And basically, it's a fat matrix kind of with all small num you know, relatively small numbers. It takes all of those measurements in, scrunches them together, and gets very good measurements. So 
And that, so, that, so beyond any measurement beyond 10K would have gone into uh, averaging, thing, you know, averaging out the noise and stuff like that. I don't know if I answered your question. That was a polite way <clears throat> he said uh, uh, no, is what he said. But Oh, well. That happens. Okay. Um, our, our next topic is also a topic uh, on which there are entire classes, like whole 10-week classes. And it's a, it's a huge area. It, it's the idea of the sensitivity of, of linear equations to data error. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, it's not something we've looked at in this class. Uh, in this class, we, uh, when you use MATLAB, for example, which in turn uses LAPAC, MATLAB does nothing. Right. When you write, when you type, you know, a backslash b, it uh, doesn't actually matter what's happening, but something like the equivalent of forming a transpose a inverse a transpose times b is happening. Um, and you know that that's not done in perfect precision. It's done with floating point numbers or whatever. Um, and that means that the numbers that come out might not be exactly right. And you're used to that because I guess when you solve some problem and you look at if AX is supposed to be equal to Y, you'd take the norm. You'd look at AX minus Y, and the entries would be on the order of 1E minus 15. And that'd be your hint that, that what you're seeing is just the artifacts of round off error and stuff like that. Well, that's a huge field. Um, it's called numerical analysis. Um, and we'll see a little bit of it now uh, about how, how this works. But singular value decomposition is central to the whole thing. So, so let's just do a square matrix just for fun. Y equals AX. Well, of course, that means X equals A inverse Y. End of story. Not much more to say. Um, actually, there's going to be more to say, and it's actually quite interesting. Now, suppose you have a noise or an error in y. For example, y becomes y plus delta y. Now, in, in numerical analysis, delta y is like a, a floating point round off error, for example. So there, it's really small, right? It, it could be on the order of, you know, 1e minus 10, or I mean, it, doesn't, it depends on the context, but it, it's, it's, we're talking errors out there in the 10th, 15th, 20th digit, right? But actually, in an engineering context, you want to imagine delta y to be, it's generally much bigger. If y is a measurement, for example, and you use a 12-bit A to D, that's only 4,000 numbers. So what that says is the fifth digit, the fourth digit, did I get that right? No, 4,000. Yes, the fourth digit is absolute nonsense if I have a 12-bit A to D. If I measure something to 12 bits, anything, doesn't matter what it is. And then I, it says basically that y, whatever the true y is, I don't know. But a delta y was added to it that was on the order of 10 to the minus, uh, uh, one, over, 1 in 4,000. Okay? Um, by the way, that's pretty good. A lot of high-speed stuff operates with much smaller precisions, like 8 bits and things like that. Okay? So, so when you're doing engineering, if you're doing economics, delta y is probably on the order of y. Basically, I mean, there, I guess, as they, as, as my friends in economics say, or, uh, well, but never on record. They, you know, when we talk about accuracy of things, and uh, they'll say things like, um, well, I'll tell you the truth. If we get the sign right, we're happy. So, but never, they'll never say that on the record. I don't know why. It's, it's some, it has to do with the sociology of the field or something. Anyway, so they're happy if they get the sign right. That means that this delta y is on the order of y. But anyway, all right. Well, if y becomes y plus delta y, x obviously becomes x plus delta x, where delta x is a inverse delta y. That's simple enough. And that says that how much x has changed because y changed is simply less, the maximum, the worst case change is norm a inverse times norm delta y. That's it. And what that says is the following. If the inverse of a matrix is large, and I mean large in norm, then it says small errors in y can lead to large errors in x. By the way, it does not say does lead. I guess do would be English, actually. But anyway, um, it does not say it must lead. That's not the case. For you to actually suffer the largest increases here, delta y has to be in the largest gain input direction of A inverse. That's what has to happen. Okay? But unless you can rule that out, it's possible, and it says you can get large errors. And now this says, basically, you really can't solve for x given y with small errors. And that means a can be considered singular in practice. Okay? So, I mean, let's just do an ex We can do a, a quick example here. And by the way, this, this clears up um, something a bit odd, well, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain now. Take a matrix that's singular. So it's n by n matrix, and it's singular. 
Okay? Then you ask someone, here's a measurement, y equals ax. I, I, I've measured it. Well, you know, this, uh, this y equals ax. Um, and x um, and y uh, plus v, so there's a small noise. v is delta y here. That's it. So, you, so that's your measurement system. And then you say, please estimate x. And someone who's taken the first three weeks of uh, two weeks of 263 will say, you can't. Your a is singular. What are you talking? I can't. I, of course, I can't. Get, I can't estimate x. That's ridiculous. In fact, you know, if it's rank n minus one, there's uh, there's a whole line of things that be that would all be abs give with no noise, give you exa the exact same answer. It's impossible. So forget it. Get yourself a better measurement setup. Okay. So you go back into the lab, and it's a fact actually that if you take a matrix A, and you add, if you pick sort of an entry at random, or if you add a small number to any, a random number to the entries, with probability one, the new matrix will be non-singular. So you go to the lab. All I have to do is find some physical measurement thing, tap on it with a hammer. I guarantee you, A is now non-singular. So very gentle tap. Just tap it once. I say, it's taken care of. No problem. And they look at A. A changed in the fifth digit. And I'd say, check it. It's non-singular. And it will be. By the way, it will absolutely be non-singular. OK? Now, and I'd say, go ahead. And then I'd walk away. But actually, I should walk away very quickly uh, because it's, it's obviously not going to work. Um, A inverse, A had a singular value that was exactly 0. After I tapped it with the measurement system with a hammer, A had a singular value that was 1e minus 8. Okay? A inverse now has a singular value that's 10 to the 8. The norm of A inverse is 10 to the 8. And that says that, if you go down the pattern here, it says that, it says that small errors in Y can be amplified by as much as a factor of 10 to the 8. Okay? So if you wanted, let's say, a couple of digits of, you know, if you wanted X to be accurate to like, you know, 0 0.01, no problem. Y has to be accurate to 10 to the minus 10. Okay? Which is not what a 16-bit A to D is going to give you or anything like that. Okay? So, I mean, this is all completely obvious. It, you know, it would be idiotic if, uh, if, if taking a little rubber hammer and tapping on a measurement setup, you know, or if I told the pilot uh, in, the, in the magnetic anomaly thing to, go, to just do another thing and I, would, I, I pushed on the, um, you know, the control stick or something like that, and that made it, that made it non-singular. Anyway, it was non-singular there anyway. But the point is, that doesn't affect anything. And it's actually it's singular value analysis that tells you this. OK. So what this says is that a matrix can be invertible. MATLAB, which is to say LA pack, will happily invert the matrix for you. By the way, if it gets too close to singular, then LA pack will issue a warning and say something like Archon warning matrix is singular to working precision. At that point, you're so far out of it, it means that basically with double precisions, it's, a, it's, it's finding out. That it's, but the, the bad part for engineering, in fact, for all applications is, well, I guess it's the good part. Uh, the, the good is, it, is that the really evil ones are when you invert it. And it's, if you see entries like 10 to the 9, 10 to the 22, you know something's fishy. But the worst part is when it's kind of plausible. And it's giving answers that are plausible, but completely wrong. That can happen, actually. OK, so, all right. Now, I think I'll just mention, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention one more thing, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll quit for, for today. Uh, what you really want to do is, you, is you're not, re I mean, it doesn't really make any sense to say that the norm of delta y is, is I mean, to say, it, if, if I ask you is, if norm delta x is 0.1 is big or small, well, it depends on, like, what x is. If the norm of x is 100, then the norm of delta x is 0.1 is pretty good. That's like a 0.1% error. If the norm of x is 0.01 and norm delta x is 0.1, that's terrible. That means that your delta x is 10 times bigger than the x you're interested in. So you should really be looking at, 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 ratio, at, at relative things, at relative errors. Now, to do that, you do this. You say, if y is ax, then norm y is less than norm a norm x. And therefore, if you work out delta x over x, this is the, this thing is the relative change in x. That's less than or equal to the norm of a times the norm of a inverse times the relative change in y. And this number comes up all the time. The product of the norm of a and the norm of a inverse, that's called the condition number, and it's traditionally called kappa of a. And it's the maximum singular value of a 
divided by the minimum. Always bigger than 1. And this is read informally something like this. It says that the relative error in the solution x is less than the relative error in the input data um, times the condition number. So the condition number is what amplifies or can amplify relative error. So that's, that's the picture. Or uh, again, ooh, there's a misspelling here. Um, but in, in terms of, if you take the log 2 of this, and again, very roughly, you'd say something like this. The number of bits of accuracy in the solution is about equal to the number of bits of accuracy in the data. That's log 2 of this thing. Minus log 2 kappa. So when you solve y equals ax for x given y, you lose accuracy. Um, by the way, if the condition number is 1, you lose no accuracy. Matrices that have condition number 1, I'll give an example, would be an orthogonal matrix. They have condition number 1. All singular values are the same. Amplification, gain factor, all directions equal. That's why people who do numerical work love them. And by the way, it's also why a lot of transforms you'll see, like DCT, FFT, or DFT, a lot of transforms you'll see actually are orthogonal. I mean, there's many reasons for it, but one nice part about it is you don't, when you, you, when you use a transform like that and then the inverse and stuff like that, you actually are not losing bits of accuracy. Okay? So this is the picture. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue from here uh, next time.